The Paris Agreement last year really set a new playing field for us all. It really set out the level of ambition to mobilise the $100 billion by 2020, um, but also indicated how, for, how much further we have to go. The climate finance flows in 2014 were $64 billion. So the gap is then $36 billion between getting from where we were in 2014 to 2020. So I guess there's three um, important themes that I would um, focus on. I think the first one is the importance of helping to value natural resources um, and sustainability. So to put a value on the natural capital. So really working closely with communities to understand what they need and what they value, working with governments, and then helping make sure that we have the policy and the regulatory frameworks in place in order to show that those um, natural resources are valued. I think the second one then is understanding the terms and the risk appetite really for large funds like the Green Climate Fund but also for donors and thinking about what that risk appetite is that's going to not over subsidise the markets. And then the third one I think is also the governments have a very important role on having a long term strategic vision and having a sense to which we want, where we want to be by 2020, by 2030 and beyond and having that in sight in the both, and the Paris is very helpful for that as are the global goals that were also agreed last year. So the Green Climate Fund is really the um, international organisation that's to make climate finance flow at scale but it's also an organisation that importantly places country ownership right at the heart of the institution. So it's also then about strengthening national capability and capacity to plan for the future, their vulnerabilities plus a low carbon future. And it's really um, an innovative institution that is really trying to help with this paradigm shift that was set out and agreed at Paris. Now, um, and so what that means is it has a private sector facility that um, other funds did not have and do not really have operating at scale. It has a gender policy, for example, right from the very establishment to show the way in which women and girls' roles are, are very central to achieving long-term change. It also has a very strong results framework and an investment framework that again is trying to lock into the policy and investment framework and um, this new paradigm. So I think the just experience to date shows that if you don't involve women, whether it's at a household level or community level um, or at a project level, and the projects are just not as viable and as sustainable because often it's women making those individual decisions about access to resources um, and controlling those resources in a way that's sometimes invisible. But also women stand to gain an awful lot as agents of change. I think part of the challenge is turning the nationally determined contributions that were all put forward at Paris into investable plans um, and that's quite a journey and so there are lots of organisations around, there are lots of governments like the UK that are willing to partner with um, country governments and help them think about that developing bankable projects and there's experience in the Global Environment Facility and the Climate Investment Funds about how to do that but I think we need to, um, the Green Climate Fund just needs to mature a little bit and show and be able to articulate better as a board what we're looking for, articulate better what the risk appetite is and send clearer signals about what kinds of projects we want to see coming through the board. I have a huge amount of confidence that in 12 months time it will feel very different and the pipeline will look very different. I think we're just at very early days. If we really want to be serious about addressing climate change and we really want to be serious about um, mitigating the risks and supporting communities build their resilience, we have to be doing it through the land and forestry.